Good morning. I'm Pastor Chuck Williams, and I'm glad you are here online worshiping with us in the sanctuary of Heartland United Methodist Church for this last service of the year. Just a couple of announcements as we begin. We'll be Zooming at noon today to have a connection time with each other. Remember, the Wednesday night Bible study will not meet, will not Zoom again until next year. If you haven't yet participated in the catch-up offering and want to, please do so by the end of the year. Mail or drop the check by the office or schedule it online on the church website or you can use your own banking system. Next week is Epiphany Sunday, which celebrates the arrival of the Magi, indicating that the news of the birth of Jesus, the light of the world, was not just for the Jews. And the Epiphany season is about God revealing Christ's light, shining and spreading throughout the world. We'll also honor the day with an abbreviated communion litany. We'll do this the first Sunday of each month, and hopefully we'll be able to do that in person with each other. But until then, we can participate online. I will bless through the technology, the elements that you prepare at home, or we have the individual wafer cup sets at church, and you can pick them up before the next Sunday. Or if you'd like to have a set but can't get out of your home, call the church office and let us know, and we'll do our best to get one to you for each participant in your household. But before we get to that today, we still have to conclude our Coming Home Advent Christmas series and the initial spreading of the news of that light of the world that has risen upon us in the manger. Let's enjoy Christmas medley from the virtual Worldwide United Methodist Choir.
Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you have come to claim us as your own. And as the year turns, we take time to remember the covenant you have established with us and the new covenant you confirmed with us through Jesus. Impress your truth upon us and receive us again in mercy as we sing our praises to you. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Tell everyone you meet what he has done. Sing praises to him. We will talk about all his wonders and honor his holy name. Let those seeking the Lord have joyful hearts. Keep your eyes open for God. Watch for his works. We will seek his face always. Be alert for signs of his presence. Remember the wonders he has done. We will remember his miraculous signs and the verdicts he has rendered. You are his servants, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His rulings are revelant everywhere on earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made to a thousand generations. He brought out his people with rejoicing. He led out his chosen ones with singing and shouts of joy. Then he gave them the lands of the nations. They inherited what others had toiled to produce. So that they could do everything God told them to observe his laws and follow his teachings. And with that, just as the deliverance from Egypt that is rejoiced over and reported in this psalm, Bethlehem's deliverance from sin by Jesus, the deliverer is rejoiced over and reported in this following song. Good Christian friends, rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Give ye heed to what we say. News, news, Jesus Christ is born today. Ox and ass before him bow, and he is in the manger now. Christ is born today. Christ is born today. Good Christian friends, rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now ye hear of endless bliss. News, news, Jesus Christ was born for this. He hath opened heaven's door, and ye are blessed forevermore. Christ was born for this, Christ was born for this. So the great news is spread, and yet the world doesn't seem as delivered and transformed as we would like it to be, especially this year with COVID. And never mind the world, sometimes we can't even figure ourselves out. Paul said it once in Romans, I do not understand what I do. The good I want to do, I don't, and the bad I don't want to do, I do do. I decide one way, but then act another. I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and do that, and I need something more. A shortened version of an old Jewish folktale reminds us that when we look at our world and life, the bigger and longer term picture is often beyond our ability to understand. The story goes, two young brothers had spent all their lives in the city. They'd never even seen a field or a pasture. One day they decided to take a trip into the countryside. And as they walked along, they spied a farmer plowing and were puzzled about what he was doing. They asked themselves, what kind of behavior is this? This fellow marches back and forth all day, scarring the earth with long ditches. Why should anyone destroy such a pretty meadow like that? Later in the afternoon, they passed by that same place again, and they saw the farmer sowing grains of wheat into the furrows. They asked themself, themselves, now what's he doing? He must be a madman. He's taking perfectly good wheat and tossing it into the ditches. One of the brothers said, this country is no place for me. The people here don't make any sense. I'm going back home. 
and he headed back to the city. But the second brother stayed in the country, and a few weeks later he saw a wonderful change. Fresh green shoots began to cover the field with lushness he had never imagined. He wrote to his brother and told him to hurry back to see the miraculous growth. He was also amazed at the change. As the days passed, they saw the green earth turn into a golden field of tall, ripe wheat. Now they thought they understood. But then the father came back with his scythe and cut it all down. And the brother who had returned from the city couldn't believe it. What's he doing now? This imbecile works all summer long to grow this wheat, and now he is destroying it. He is crazy after all. I'm going back to the city. The first brother had more patience. He stayed and watched while the farmer collected the weed and took it to his granary, where he cleverly separated out the chaff and stored the rest. He was filled with awe when he realized that by sowing a bag of seed, the farmer had harvested a whole field of grain. And then, only then did he truly understand that the farmer had a reason for everything he did. And this is how it is with God's works too, he said. We mortals see only the beginnings of his plan. We can't understand the full purpose and end of his creation. So we must have faith in his wisdom. We can't always see the work of God and what he's doing in the world and even what he's doing in us. And if we actually do see his work, we may not understand it. And worse, sometimes we despise what we do not understand. You hear all the name-calling in that story. But God grasps such a bigger picture than we can possibly see. That is when we fill in the, have to fill in the gaps of our understanding with trust that he loves us and knows us and knows our world, and he knows what he is doing better than we do. And we must have faith that he has the power to carry his good plans to fruition and it is because of that faith and trust in him that we can open our hearts to and worship him for the future he envisions for us and for our world. Plans that began in the baby Jesus so long ago. Donna and Kathy are going to play an Italian piece called Gesù Bambino, Jesus Child. The melody and chorus are derived from Adeste Fidelis, O Come All Ye Faithful. Its tune was also used in a popular English carol, when blossoms flowered mid the snows, but some of the original Italian lyrics are more literally translated this way. In the humble hut, in cold and poverty, the holy infant is born, who the world will adore. O beautiful boy, do not cry. Redeemer, your mother cradles you, kisses you, O Savior. Hosanna, Hosanna, sing with a joyous heart, your shepherds and angels, O King of light and love. Come, let us adore, come, let us adore, come, let us adore the Lord.
And one way we adore him is by honoring, glorifying the name of Jesus, who's the King of Kings and the sacrificial lamb who died and live again, making him the Lord of life, who came to save us from the curse of sin and death. We will glorify the King of kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. And this Lord of heaven, Lord of earth, He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe, all praise to him we give. O oh God, King of the world and ruler of our hearts, you are our covenant friend. You've been gracious to us through all the years of our lives. We thank you for your loving care which has brought us to this time and place. You have comforted us with family and friends. You have satisfied our hungry hearts and given us your peace. You have been our light in darkness and a rock of strength in adversity and temptation. This week, this week we lift up all those dealing with COVID in one form or another, be it being ill or caring for those who are ill or facing financial challenges or the challenges of isolation and the loss of normal patterns of living and all the rest. Thanks for the coming vaccines and prayer that they will be effective and for persistent diligence in safe practices. And we can find good spirits in this season despite the pandemic. We also pray for Jan Martin's son Brian and wife in Tennessee as he feel, feels ill. For Ione Bennett who received some bruises due to recent fall as well as others that you lay on our heart in this moment of silence. Lord, Christmas reminds us that you remember us even when we forget you. You patiently stay with us even when we flee from you. When we come to our senses and return to you, you meet us with overflowing grace and forgiveness. You redeem us from sin and give us a high calling in Jesus and then enable us to fulfill that call by the gift of your spirit and the fellowship of your people in your church whom you have taught to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In anticipation of the next series, and the Magi arriving to see and glorify Jesus, we too long to see him, recognize him for who he is as Lord, and gift ourselves to him by setting aside meaner, lesser priorities, and rising up to follow him. We would see Jesus, lo, his star is shining above the stable while the angels sing. There in a manger on the hay reclining, haste, let 
Let us lay our gifts before the King. We would see Jesus, Mary's Son, most holy, light of the village life from day to day, shining revealed through every task most lowly, the Christ of God, the life, the truth, the way. We would see Jesus in the early morning, still as of old he calleth follow me. Let us arise, O oh, meaner service scorning. Lord, we are thine, we give ourselves to The Ark of the Covenant was a gold-covered chest designed primarily to carry the two stone tablets of the law. It signified God's presence within his people. They would go before it to seek God's direction. They carried it with them into battle. On one occasion, the Philistines captured the Ark and the Israelites mourned that God had deserted them. Wherever the Philistines placed it in their land, that area experienced misfortune. To remove the curse, they returned it to the Israelites. David arranged for a great celebration as they processed the ark back home, and he composed a psalm of thanks for the occasion. In it, he recalls God's deliverance of his people from Egyptian slavery, reminding the people to praise God because he doesn't change. He never deserts his people and always remembers his promises. Just a few of David's lyrics. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing praise to him. Tell all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. You, his servants, his chosen ones, remember the wonders he has done, his miracles, and the justice he pronounced. He is the Lord our God. His authority is seen throughout the earth. He remembers his covenant promise forever. One church began a weekly Bible study called Shafa, capital S, capital H, small I, capital F, capital A. An acronym built around Psalm 105, which is a near verbatim quote of the psalm recorded in 1 Chronicles 16 that we just heard, and specifically the verse that exhorts us to seek his face always, Shafa. By following by calling it the Shafa, we constantly reminded ourselves that our group's purpose was to seek God, to learn about him, to draw closer to him, to take action for him, to be and do better at keeping our side of the covenant promises with our Lord. This is what was in the hearts of the people in our text in Luke 2, 22 through 40. They were waiting to see God's salvation. Anna was a senior widow who lived in worship at the temple. Simeon was promised by God that he would see the long-awaited Messiah before he died. The Spirit moved Simeon to walk among the temple courts. On the same day, Joseph and Mary brought eight-day-old Jesus to the temple. They had come to follow the traditional Jewish laws of purification rites and presenting Jesus to the Lord. Simeon saw them coming and took Jesus into his arms and he blessed them with these words. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace 
For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Then he said to Mary, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. As Simeon finished, Anna walked up and she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. The Holy Family proceeded into the temple to fulfill their religious requirements and then returned home to Nazareth. And Jesus grew and became strong and wise and God's grace was on him, our text concludes. That last verse was a summarizing phrase about all those years we know so little about. There's only one other story of Jesus between that day and the next day when actually Soon we read about him as an adult beginning his ministry. This is the culmination of what started at the beginning of this coming home series when people lost track of what was important because life is too busy and too diverting. They suffer the consequences of being off of God's rails like a train is off a track. These consequences drive them to hope that God would rip open the heavens and come down and make his home with his people again. When people recommit to God's spiritual track, they discover that God is more than willing to forgive and restore and fill with joy, even though circumstances may remain challenging. They open their lives and hearts to him. Joseph and Mary open their lives to the Messiah, the one born to them, and he still enters hearts willing to become his home today. When we see the one who delivers us, as Anna did as Simeon did, as others did. When we see him, how do we react to what we see? Our two prophets, Simeon and Anna, may help us in how we should respond. We can only guess at what stirred within them when they saw Jesus. It had to be more than just the sight of a baby. They would have seen parents bringing their newborns repeatedly to the temple. They would have shared the joy with those parents at the sight of the newborn, just as we do as we see newborns wherever we travel. But they sensed something more in this baby Jesus that was life-changing for them. And they knew it would be life-changing for the world as well. They saw in Jesus a destiny of hope, not only for Israel, but for the salvation of all people. Do we see Christ as a savior of the world? Or maybe the more important question is, when we see other people, do we see them as potential recipients of this salvation? Simeon also saw that people would be polarized about the truth of who Jesus was and what he was offering, forcing people to make a choice and to reveal their hearts. Would they choose God's way or not? Not all hearts were going to get on track with God's plan of salvation. It was the negative side of this polarization that put Christ on the cross and pierced Mary's heart with grief. It is a choice that still needs to be made by each one of us today. What is our reaction to Christ's presence among us? What does it feel like? How is he changing our lives? On which side of the pole will we stand? Will we, as Paul described his pre-conversion experience of Christ when he opposed Jesus, as deeply struggling to kick against the goads? That phrase conjures up the image of a yoked oxen pulling the plow. When the ox tried to resist his calling to plow as he should and veered off of the furrow and he got off track, the farmer took a goad, a long slender stick made of wood or iron, and with a point on the end, and he used it to encourage the wayward ox back in line. That's a nice way of putting it. Stubborn oxen would sometimes kick against the gold rather than obey its proddings. But in the long run, they found it was in their best, own best interest to obey the master, the farmer. So one action, one side of the goad pole, if you will, is to keep kicking, to continue resisting what God is calling us to be and to do in some task, some ministry, some habit, some area of our life. 
The other option is to follow Christ's example that was at the end of this text. We can move into the new year with a renewed determination to grow in godly wisdom and strength. And we can follow Anna's example who shared the news of Christ whenever she crossed paths with someone who was seeking redemption in their life. But like that, it's a kind of a no-brainer, but applying the answer to the practice of our life isn't always as easy. Before this week ends, we will be entering into a new year. Some of us will make resolutions. It's easy to say we want to grow in godly wisdom and strength, but how do we plan to go about it? What would it look like in my life to be more pleasing to God in 2021? What old practices may I need to put away? What new practices may I need to incorporate? What kind of results may I want to discover in my life when I prepare to enter 2022? In other words, look 12 months ahead to the end of 2021 and imagine realistically what I want my life to look like then. And what do I need to do now to make that happen? As a starting point, Taylor Burton Edwards suggested we focus on three words found in our two prophets. He calls them the impact creator of Jesus coming to us. All three words, redemption, falling, and rising, are in a grammatical form that indicates that it is something that has begun in Christ's arrival, but it is still an ongoing God process. God's process of unfolding his rule in the hearts of humanity continues and continues and continues right up to this day and in our hearts. Redemption means something is bought back. Simple example, I want some quick cash, I go to the pawn shop and sell them my watch. Later I come back to buy the watch back and I have redeemed it, I bought it back from the pawnbroker. Another example is if someone is kidnapped or taken prisoner of war and a ransom is paid to get them back. The person is redeemed, rescued, freed. And the one who paid the price is the redeemer, the deliverer. In spiritual terms, every time God's people were taken captive or got off track, taken captive by the Egyptians, by the Babylonians, by the Romans, just to name a few, but ultimately taken captive by sin, God did something or sent someone to pay the price to set his people free from whoever or whatever enslaved them. He redeemed them, bought them back as his people. Ultimately, he sent Jesus first to the manger and then to the cross. And he's still bringing his deliverance to all who are held captive by sin and death by fear, by disease, by all forms of evil, injustice, and oppression. As redemption begins with each of our own hearts, with faithful justice and loving grace, and involves falling. Literally, it means a downward displacement in rank or in power or in status. It involves letting go, giving up those actions and attitudes in our life where we are unfaithful and unjust and unloving and withholding grace. When I mention those negative traits to some group or person or situation flash through your mind. These traits are often easily justified and disguise themselves as honorable, yet they hold us hostage. When Christ comes to liberate, those in charge have to let go of their charge. If sin and evil rules, then sin and evil must lose its power. Just like Pharaoh had to release his power over the Hebrew slaves and kings had to release their hold over the exiles, and we, we must surrender control of our life. If Christ rules, everything else must fall underneath that rule. The question is, will the falling be forced upon us like those Old Testament rulers, or will we cooperate with it and let it work for us? As God enlightens us, receive his forgiveness and acceptance, allow God's compassionate love and justice dictate our attitudes and our decisions and the direction of our lives and become an advocate for justice and compassion for others. Bernard Clairvaux suggests that we have the option of two spiritual paths. One is the path of ascent. It is a path where we attempt to work our way up to God. And as we move along the path, it may look and feel like progress and elevation, but in truth, self-made salvation is the surest path to destruction. The other path he calls abnegation, which moves the opposite direction. Rather than trying to save ourselves, it seeks surrender and release to God at every point 
allowing him to save us. It may look and feel like a continuous falling, but it is the means by which God lifts us up, purifies us, and most fully sets us apart as his. Yes, it's humbling. It was humbling for the slaves of Egypt to realize they could not save themselves, but needed to trust and obey God's direction, especially through a shepherd named Moses, who they had already rejected years earlier. It was humbling for the exiles to realize they needed to turn back to God and allow him to lead them through people like Nehemiah and Ezra back to the homeland out of exile and a rebuilding of the city. And it was humbling for those same people to listen to the prophets to help them rebuild their spiritual lives. And it is humbling for us to recognize that we cannot conquer the sin that is within us, much less the sin in anyone else, without submitting our fallen natures, without submitting our lives to Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God. It is in the humbling, the falling, the surrendering of ourselves that allows the process of rising, literally resurrecting or uprising, to begin. We move from an old, dark, deathly, no life to a new, enlightened, vibrant, empowered life because we have been redeemed, bought back. And whatever powers that had been suppressing life is thrown off by Christ. That is why Jesus' self-described mission was to announce this rising of himself, which is good news for the poor, freedom for prisoners, sight to the blind, and setting free the oppressed and proclaiming the year of God's bountiful pleasure with his people. And in the Sermon of the Mount, he announced God's blessing and coming happiness to all those who didn't currently experience, but would trust him and recognize their need for him. Something has to fall so that something new can come. That's why Peter encourages us to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand, fall to him that he may lift us up. It is how we can rise and encourage others to rise to new heights that we could not even imagine. Whenever we take obedient action to overcome what is defeating us, whenever we take action to improve the quality of life for another, we are cooperating with and participating in Christ rising among us. Redemption, falling, rising. Let's make it practical. Many of us, especially as the new year starts, may want to set our sights on doing something different or doing more of something good, rising. But those goals are often hindered and frustrated by the fact that we are people of habitual routines that fill all of our time. We cannot reach for the good. We cannot rise without falling, without sacrificing something we are currently doing because we all always have exactly 86,400 seconds in a day. And if we want to add something into those seconds, what is currently in those seconds has to be displaced. Because outside of one Old Testament Joshua story, it says, Jesus said, even by worrying, we cannot add one hour to our life. The inherent problem with rising, instilling a new practice in life is often not so much the challenge of the new practice itself as it is the falling away, the eliminating from our life something that will free up the time and space to establish that new practice. By the way, the opposite is also true. If we are trying to end something in our life, then we must fill that vacuum with something else or the old practice will come back at us stronger than ever. Simple illustration. Let's say as I enter 2021, I want to improve my exercise life or increase my prayer life. Let's imagine I choose to wake up an hour earlier in the day to do that. The challenge probably isn't going to be exercising, I know how to do that, or praying, I know how to do that. The problem is going to be in denying myself that morning sleep that I feel I need. And or denying myself the normal morning routine, for I am habitual. When I get up, I do this and this and this, and then I go to work. So even if I manage to overcome the craving to sleep and get up an hour earlier, I will still be tempted to do my normal routine steps of this and this and this, and I go to work. And instead of getting the new thing into my life, I will simply arrive at work an hour earlier because I'm habitual. The real challenge will be changing the old habitual activity to include the more and new or different practice in the habitual routine. I suspect it is the goal of most of us to allow Christ to create his home in our lives 
and for him to keep on remodeling and restoring our hearts so that we are more and more comfortable with him and he with us, just like we continue to rebuild, maintain our homes to make them better for ourselves and for others. Like the brothers observing the farmer, we may not always understand what God is wanting to sow into our world or even into our own lives, but we can trust that we, he knows what he is doing and each of us needs to ask God's guidance in what needs to rise and what needs to fall in our lives to further along his redeeming work in us and in his world as we resolve our way into the next year of 2021. Let's pray. As we resolve to get started in a new year, Lord, help us to consider the right questions. Do we see you? How are we responding to that sight? Are we listening for what you are asking of us to let this fall away and to rot this to rise in our life? Show us what needs to be mercilessly uprooted from our life. Sow what you want to plant and raise in us so that we can even more effectively carry on your redeeming work in us and for others in 2021 and beyond. Empower us to know and live according to your instructions, to let things fall away in order to raise up your kingdom. Show us how to envision you as Simeon and Anna did in their life-changing moments, that we may recognize you as ruler of all, and you become our highest priority, harvesting a crop of good character no matter what befalls us, whatsoever circumstances we may face. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence my love. Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word. I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou and thou only first in my heart. Great God of heaven, my treasure. Thou art great God of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright and sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. Know without a doubt that the great mystery of our faith is confirmed by the Spirit, seen by angels and announced to the nations, believed in throughout the world, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who makes his home around, with, and in all who welcome him. Amen. Thank you.